Well, good morning, church family. It's good to see everyone here this morning, and I'm glad those watching online. Welcome to Radiant Life. My name's Ryan. I'm our vision and teaching pastor here. I don't know about you, but I love looking outside, seeing the snow right now, right? I love it. How many of you love it? Raise your hand. How many of you wish it was 70 degrees in sun right now? Oh, wow, wow, all right. Those watching online, why don't you go ahead and in the comments put what your weather's like. So I know we have people watching from Texas to Florida to North Carolina all the way to Washington all over. So put it, it's snowing here. Um, hey, I'm so thankful that we get to worship together. I love being able on Sundays to come together and worship with you guys. Before we jump in, though, I, I want to say just two words. Two simple words. Go blue. All right? That's all I got to say. That's all I got to say. Um, I, hey, uh, when you came in this morning, uh, I have this right here, this white uh, thing. You should have gotten a paper measuring tape. If you did not get a paper measuring tape, would you just either A, raise your hand, or B, go out to the exit doors and grab one, okay? Because this is a sermon illustration. As Pastor Brandon teaches today, this is how he wraps up the message time together. So right now, you're going to want to grab one of these because it is his linchpin to the entire message, so to speak. It's how he wraps up. So hold on to that, and then when you have it, set it aside for a while because, again, it's at the very close of his message. At least you'll have it for that at the very end. Before we jump in through worship through song, I want to read us something. It's found in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. It says this, Then the one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, referring to Jesus here, the root of David has conquered. He's conquered so that he is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. And then John, who wrote this, says, then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne. These two references to a lion and a lamb is referring to Jesus. The descendant in the lineage is Jesus from the tribe of Judah, which was depicted as a lion. And in here we said that there's, I see a lion that is a conquering one. It is Jesus because he's conquering. But I see a lamb in the midst of the throne because Jesus was our lamb that was sacrificed for the forgiveness of our sins. This morning we're going to start with a song called Lion and the Lamb. And it's all in reference to who our Savior and Messiah, Jesus Christ, is. One who conquers as a lion and one who was slaughtered in our place as our sacrificial lamb. So why don't we stand here today and let's worship through song together.
Portion of scripture from John 11. And this story comes from when Jesus was deeply moved and he went to the tomb of Lazarus. And in verse 40, Jesus said to Martha, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? And to be honest with you, this morning has been a little chaotic, a little crazy, but even when things seem a little bit crazy, a little bit uh, as, as final as Lazarus in the grave, they seem difficult, right? even in those times, God is going to work all of it out for his glory. So whatever it is that you might be struggling with, whatever it is that you might be bringing into this room this morning, uh, I, I pray that slowly and surely you would find that God is going to use it all for his glory. I was buried beneath my shame. could carry that kind of weight it was my tomb till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my faith
the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world Lord, thank you for this time of worship Thank you for this place that we can gather and learn more about you grow in our relationship with you. Lord, I pray for Pastor Brandon as he's about to bring the word. I pray that you would give him the words to speak and we would all be blessed by what he's about to share. Amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. Good morning, church family. Hey, way to brave the snow for snow of the year. You drove in. Awesome. Hey, if you're a guest here today, my name is Brandon. I'm the lead pastor of campuses here at Radiant Life, and uh, welcome. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, we're in a teaching series called Everyday Disciple, and we've been working through these different characteristics of uh, a, a everyday disciple, excuse me, sorry, I misspoke. I think I did that last service, didn't I? That's okay. I got the good nod from Pastor Ryan, so I'm, I'm still on the good side there. So I just wanna give you a lay of the land here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a quick review of the last three weeks, and then next week we're gonna, we're gonna put the bow tie on this whole Everyday Disciple teaching series, and then we're, we'll transition to a new teaching series. Uh, so we're starting the descent on the plane, but I wanna do a quick review, and then we're gonna unpack that last characteristic of an Everyday Disciple, and I wanna bring some kind of like head knowledge, like showing that scripture talks about this, and then what I'm hoping is that we'll transition during the teaching, as Pastor Ryan likes to say, move that 18 inches from the head to the heart. And I'm hoping that it won't just be information today, that it will move from the head into the heart because, man, when it moves into the heart, that's where the life transformation happens, amen? All right, so here, here's just a quick review. Pastor Ryan, he shared all of this during week one. We need a compelling and contextual picture for how people's lives will be different if they follow Jesus and join in on the church's vision and mission. So the, the vision of the church here at Radiant Life, what God has called us as, as a, a family of followers is that everyone would come fully alive in Jesus Christ. That's where you're supposed to say amen. Okay, so let's try it again. We desire that everybody comes fully alive in Jesus Christ. Yeah. There we go, now you're into it. And now how do we do that? By living out our God-given purpose every single day, by being transformed by Jesus, reaching the lost, and making disciples who make disciples. If you're calling, that was, yeah, that was good, whoever said the amen. That was awesome. You, I wasn't ready for that. That was good. So like if, you're, like if you're calling Radiant Life home, this is your family, this is what God's called us to do. This is the vision and mission of the church. And so if anything showed us during shutdowns is like we, like we weren't living into this, we, we didn't have clarity when it came to discipleship. So we need uh, a clear discipleship pathway and we need a clear everyday disciple. Like we need that language. And so these last three weeks and now four weeks, we're describing the second half of this statement. We're describing what an everyday disciple looks like. Like this is, this is the output, okay? The discipleship pathway is the input in order for the output to happen. We're gonna talk about the discipleship pathway next week. That's how we're gonna put the bow tie on this whole thing is like, how, how do we get to the everyday disciple? And we're gonna show what God has uh, called us and what we are going to do here at Radiant Life. So our hopes is, because we have a clear discipleship pathway and clarity about what an everyday disciple happens, it's going to spark a disciple-making movement. And that this vision and mission is actually going to be lived out. It's not just something that they talk about on stage where we actually go live this out the other days of the week. That's what we're hoping. Because here's the thing, like, healthy sheep are gonna breed healthy sheep. And so if we grab a hold of that, man, like, we're already busting at the seams now. Like, literally, we don't have enough space in our building. We need to expand already. But I'm telling you, if you all just grab a hold of this idea of the discipleship pathway and an everyday disciple, oh dude, watch out, that's exactly right. 
Our community, oh man, I hope you catch that. So but the problem is we want to measure what's easiest but not what's the best. Like it's the butt and bucks, right? Like those are easy to measure. We can count how many people are in the room and we can count how much money came in. But I don't know that that's the right thing to be measuring, right? So the myth is program activity equals transformation. That's a myth. Yes, we do have programs, we do have activities that happen here that can help in your transformation, but just because you show up to this thing doesn't mean transformation is going to happen. Because we're gonna tell people how to live their lives will be busier, but not how they will be fully alive with Jesus. Like the programs, the activities, God can use those things to help you be aware or to become fully alive in Jesus Christ. All right, so quick recap. Here's, here's the, all the characteristics of an everyday disciple. So week one, we talked about a spirit-led follower. Now you can see the description's a little longer on this. Seeking to obey and to follow Jesus as we are transformed through the filling and the empowerment of Holy Spirit and the saturation of his word. If you don't start off with this one, you can't do the rest of them. Like this is what holds all of it together. It's hard to be a force for good if you're not being led by the Spirit. If you're not allowing that empowerment or really that transformation to happen in your life. It all hinges on being a Spirit-led follower. Out of that, we're a force for good, having kingdom impact where I live, work, and play. Because we're filled with his spirit, we usher in the kingdom of God where we work, live, and play. Are you catching this? And then that also overflows into our relationships. We're gonna be purposeful in our relationships. We're gonna be a purposeful friend, reaching the lost and marginalized where I live, work, and play. I wanna hone in on marginalized. Marginalized is probably the people that you didn't invite over for Thanksgiving this week. They probably smell a little different, and they probably talk a little different. But Jesus modeled going outside of cultural boundaries, and he reached the marginalized. And as followers of Jesus, if we're gonna be an everyday disciple, we might need to get out of our comfort zones and reach the marginalized that are within our community. And that's challenging. So today we're gonna to talk about the fourth and final characteristic, which is a humble leader. Leading other disciples to make disciples where I live, work, and play. So I'm gonna give you three verses that will kind of solidify this point. This is kind of like the information download to you guys. I'm gonna show you three scriptures that support this idea of a humble leader, and then we're gonna kind of transition the teaching. So you you can't talk about discipleship without talking about the Great Commission. So if you've been a part of the church world for any significant time, you've probably heard the words Great Commission. It's found in Matthew 28, starting at verse 18. It says, Jesus came near and said to them, the them is his disciples, the 12 that he did life with. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and this is what you're gonna do. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and remember, I'm with you always to the end. So here's the cool thing. It's really simple. Jesus said, love God and love your neighbor. Like, that's what we're supposed to do with our discipleship. So if you're not loving your neighbor well, that's probably your next step, is to learn how to love one another. If you're like, I have no idea what Jesus, how he lived or how he taught or what he's commanding us to do, it's awesome. We have a Bible and in it are four different accounts of the life of Jesus. We call them the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read all of those. There's gonna be overlap in some of the stories. Some of them are gonna tell different details because they have a different perspective. But we simply just need to follow and observe what Jesus did and how he did it and then we try to implement that, implement that in our, into our life. We model that for other people. So teaching them to observe everything I've commanded. Here's the thing, like, those two things are really hard. Love God, love your neighbors. And maybe this week was stressful because of people that are in your life that you didn't want to love this week. That's a reality. <laughs> um, it's simple what we're supposed to do 
but it can also be challenging as well, which I think it also goes back to that very first characteristic. We need to be spirit-led in our relationships. All right, here's a second example about discipleship, and this is written by a guy named Paul. Paul was a church destroyer. He was trying to take down the church, had this encounter with Jesus, and ever since that moment, he started planting churches all over, and he had a protege named Timothy, and he wrote this letter to Timothy. In 2 Timothy 2.2, it says, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So this is really cool. Let's look at this observation. Paul is overflowing to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, overflow this to faithful men and have them overflow it to others. Now, I'm not really good at math, but four generations of discipleship is modeled right here. Here's the challenge. How many generations of discipleship can you measure in your life? I'm not saying four people that you've discipled. I'm talking about four generations of people that you've discipled. People that you've done life with, that you've invested in, and then that person takes and is transformed, and, and God does their, his own thing on them, and, and then they went and did that with someone else. And then those, those people did something with someone else. That's challenging to me. I can measure four or three generations right now of people that I've just done life with, I've invested in, I've tried to be transparent about what God has done in my life, and I've tried to share those things with them, and then they have gone and done the same thing. So I can measure up to three. I'm not batting a 1,000 quite yet, but I'm hoping to get there. But the challenge is, we can see here in Scripture, you know, I was never really good at math when it included words in the math problems. So this is one of those story problems. But we see four generations here. I think we can eliminate, oh, man, I am struggling with that word today. That's all right, Lord, you got it. I think we can, I think we can measure discipleship in our life. Thank you. I might pick on you here in a little bit. <laughs> All right, so Paul, he got it. We can measure that. We have a story problem now. But then he's like, well, how do you actually do that? Like, what does that look like? Well, he wrote to one of the churches that he planted in Thessalonica. And he said, you know how we lived among you for your benefit, and you yourselves became imitators of us and of the Lord, when, in spite of severe persecution, you welcomed the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. As a result, you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Ahia. This is awesome. So Paul says, hey look, I came and lived with you, which requires relationship. I know that's a challenge, introverts, but you gotta do some relationship with some people. I, I'm just pressing in a little bit there. But like Paul lived with them, which means he was relational with them, and he tried to give them an example to imitate, which was ultimately him trying to imitate Jesus. And they received it, they welcomed it in spite of persecution. We are not under persecution here in our area. So what I'm hoping is that you will welcome this message here today by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because here's the thing, if you welcome this message, we can be an example to believers in Macedonia, Ahia, Sturgis, Three Rivers, Cold Water. Your example of Jesus will affect these other communities. I hope that you grab this. If there's anything that it seems like it resembles Jesus, grab a hold of that and try to incorporate that into your life. Now, to really try to pound in this point, I grabbed a bunch of different quotes on discipleship. So I'm gonna go through them quickly. If you want them, just take a picture of the screen really quick. Timothy Keller says, discipleship is not an option. Jesus says that if anyone would come after me, he must follow me. If you're claiming the blood of Jesus as your Lord and Savior, discipleship is not an option. You are called to be a humble leader. You are called to be an everyday disciple who disciples other people. Pastor Robbie Gallaty, this is gonna be on two different screens. I love this quote, it challenged me like crazy. Robbie Gallaty says, when the church becomes an end in itself, it ends. When Sunday school, as great as it is, 
becomes an end in itself, it ends. When small group ministry becomes an end in itself, it ends. When the worship service becomes an end in itself, it ends. You know what shook me on this one? I love small groups, what we call life groups here at Radiant Life. Like, man. Like, I was pursuing Jesus and got connected into a group and met my wife. I wasn't going into the group to go look for a spouse. I was trying to pursue Jesus. She was trying to do the same thing, and God brought us together. Like, that's my number one, like, yes, small groups are awesome. But God has also used that to reveal things in my life. I would observe how other people would um, respond to their kids or their spouse, and it's like, man, I don't do that, but I like what they're doing. I like the example. I've also seen some bad examples of like, I'm definitely not gonna go down that road. <laughs> but I love, like, but here's the thing. If small groups is the end goal, like, hey everybody, come to, come to worship service on Sunday and I'll go get in a small group. If that's what our discipleship, it's gonna end. God uses small groups and life groups in our discipleship, but that's not the end goal of a small group. It's just one spoke in the wheel of many spokes that God wants to use in your discipleship. Robbie uh, continues with this quote. He says, what we need is for discipleship to become the goal. Then the process never ends. The process is fluid, it is moving, it is active, it is a living thing. It must continue to go on. Every disciple must make disciples. Healthy sheep will breed sheep. We're sheep. But man, God cares for us as sheep. He's the ultimate shepherd. I love Charles Swindoll's quote on discipleship. Fortunately, God made all varieties of people with a wide variety of interests and abilities. He has called people of every race and color who have been hurt by life in every manner imaginable. Even the scars of past abuse and injury can be the means of bringing healing to another. What a wonderful opportunity to make disciples. That's been my journey. His God has done a work in my life and he begins to do transformation into my life. All I try to do is overflow that to other people. Some of you have experienced some horrific things. And in God's economy, he can absolutely turn that upside down. And he can absolutely get glory and he can absolutely use that to help other people. Now you can't, do any kind of teaching about discipleship and not have a Dallas Willard quote. Dallas Willard says, discipleship is the process of becoming who Jesus would be if he were you. I don't know what it's like to be a single mom, but how do you live your life if Jesus was you? If you're divorced, if you're married, if you're single, well, Jesus did model that. We can easily see that in the Gospels, that Jesus modeled a single life. And just let me be clear, like, getting married is not the end goal. You don't have to get married. But if Jesus were you, in your workplace, in your relationships, what would that look like if Jesus were you? So here's, here's the big thing. The call of discipleship is for all believers. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you're a follower of Jesus, there is a calling of discipleship that is on your life. Now this is where I wanna transition our time. I just brought you a bunch of information. I, I brought you some scripture, I brought you some quotes, and now it's all sitting here. Here's what I'm hoping for the remainder of our time happens. That it begins to move from our mind to our heart and that something would radically change inside of us for the moments that we have left here together. Now, if you did bring your Bibles, uh, if you have a tablet or whatever, head over to Matthew chapter 25. And we're gonna look at a parable or a word picture, a story that Jesus is going to tell to illustrate a point. And as you're turning there, uh, some of you are already there. At the beginning of this chapter, you're gonna see maybe in your heading the parable of the 10 virgins. And, and this was a story that Jesus was telling about, hey, you don't know when I'm gonna return, but I want you to be ready. And then he shares this story about the talents, and it's about the effort that we can put into it. And so in Matthew chapter 25, and we're gonna pick up in verse 14, it says, for it's just like a man about to go on a journey. 
He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one, he gave five talents. To another, two talents. And to another, one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. So, like, don't get too hung up on the details. I know story problems are hard. I get it. Like, I, I feel your pain on that. But there's three people. One has five, one has two, and one has one. And it's based on their abilities. And what we're going to observe is, what do they do based on their abilities? That's the point that I want you to catch here today. So immediately, the man who had received five talents went and put them to work and earned five more. In the same way, the man with two earned two more. I should have highlighted that one. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled an account with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Say these four words with me. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Say these four words. Share your master's joy. I think sometimes we're searching for joy or happiness in other areas when we just need to pause, pump the brakes, and we need to share in our master's joy instead. I hope you catch this. That this is a shift in our mind. Is that instead of pursuing these other things that the world is trying to offer, what if we pursued what the master's joy is because he's going to share that with us? That's a shift especially against our consumeristic culture that we live in, that we deserve this, we deserve that. We need to constantly have this in when we just need to share in the Father's joy because, I, man, I'm telling you, when you taste and see that, you're not gonna want what the world has to offer. What if we were to pursue what the Father or the Master desires because he's gonna share that joy with us? Now the story turns. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathered where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and I went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. This word afraid. I think there's a difference between being afraid of God and the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is reverence for God. I'm wondering for some of us, we're afraid of God. And I'm going on a hunch here. And, and, I'm, and I'm overflowing what I'm saying based out of my own experience is maybe we're afraid of God because we don't understand God's character. We don't understand the Father's love that he has for his creation. His hesed, his faithful love, his loyal love that he has for his creation. I think maybe that's your next step. Like if you're afraid of God, if you're afraid to open up the junk drawers of your heart, that closet that you don't want anybody to see, the caverns of your heart, if you're afraid to show God that, I think your next step is to fully understand or at least attempt to understand the character of God and who he truly is. And I get it, some of us were hung up for legitimate reasons. We haven't had a good earthly example. It's hard. And quite often, the father figures that are in our life haven't been the greatest. And so it's hard for us to see the true character of our heavenly father. So my encouragement to you is if you've got any kind of fear of God, like you can't abandon every aspect of your life over to him, I would encourage you to truly seek out the character of God. And now Jesus, he really hones in his point here. Oh man, these are strong words. Verse 26, his master replied to him, you evil, 
lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I would have received my money back with interest when I return. So take this talent from him and give it to the one who had 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. And throw this good for nothing servant into the outer darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that sounds awful. I love William Barclay's thoughts on this whole passage. He says, human beings are not equal in talent, but they can be equal in effort. The master wants to share his joy with the people that went and immediately took that talent, that treasure, and did something with it. God is imprinted on each one of you as followers of Jesus with different God-given abilities and talents, your individual stories, your individual backgrounds, and he wants to use it. And I think the challenge for us is are we putting any kind of effort into this? Now be, let me be a thousand percent clear here. Our effort isn't going to earn any more of God's love. Our faith is not based on works. Your good works is not going to get you saved. Only your faith and trust and surrender to Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That's it. It's by the blood of Jesus. However, out of that love and that faith, we can have effort. Dallas Willard, he words it beautifully. Grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Earning is an attitude. Effort is an action. Yes, we can try really hard. We can, you know, we can be sold out for Jesus and maybe we gotta just swim in grace because we screw things up. Maybe that's just my walk <laughs> of me just swimming in grace and screwing things up but I constantly am trying to put effort into it. So may we be a people who live 100% of what God has given us. Whether he's given you two talents, five talents, or a thousand talents, may we put 100% into whatever he has given us. Now Pastor Josh gave a beautiful word picture a couple weeks ago, and it was the qualification fallacy. Basically, it means that progress is greater than perfection. And he showed this scale. And I don't know about, like, I'm just curious, maybe a quick raise of hands. Did, like, did you immediately process where you were at on the scale? That's about what I thought. Because I asked that same question to the staff in my life group, and no one really thought about where they were, being, uh, where they were at on the scale. Now, Pastor Josh, he put this, he put this number up there. Maybe you're a 2.5 sort of thing. Now, for me, the way I processed it, and maybe I'm just super arrogant and prideful, and I would receive uh, uh, a rebuke on that, but I, I put myself at 51. Because I believe that more than half of me is absolutely surrendered over to Jesus, and he's guiding me. It's not about perfection. Even if you are a 2.5 on the scale, a, a silly scale, there are people who are at 0 0.5, at 0.75, at 0.1. Whatever the Lord's been teaching you, you can meet that person where they're at. Maybe you're arrogant and prideful like me and you're at a 51. Well, then you've got a bunch of people to work with. God deeply desires to use you. Now here are some questions to wrestle with when it comes to the idea of being a humble leader. Who am I helping take one step closer to Jesus? If you're the, the 2.5, who's that 1.0 person that you're helping them take one step closer to Jesus? Who are you discipling on a weekly basis? Maybe a, a deeper question to that one is, are you even investing into someone on a weekly basis? Am I in 
encouraging the people who I am discipling to go and disciple other people. So write these questions down. Take a picture of it. If you're a follower of Jesus, God has called you to be an everyday disciple and to be a humble leader. And we need to submit ourselves to him and just try to overflow, try to imitate Jesus to the people that we rub elbows with. Now, what I'm gonna say now is gonna be very sobering. And I wanna be sensitive to our church family because it's been a very challenging couple of months. When it comes to this everyday disciple thing, we have no idea how many days we have. The half-brother of Jesus, he says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. Life is like a vapor. It's here and it's gone. The wisdom of Psalms 90, 12 says, number your days so that you may develop wisdom in your heart. I want you to pull out that tape measure and unfold it. And you'll notice that it's inches on top and centimeters on the bottom. And according to Google researching, life expectancy is at 76 in the U.S. So fold the tape measure at 76. And now go to your age and rip that off. My tape measure is pretty short. And some of your tape measures are even shorter. And some of you are in the negative. We're not guaranteed these 76 years. And I think for some folks, that reality is very real. But this is sobering. If we were to actually number our days, the scripture says we will develop wisdom. You know how uh, my interpretation of that is? You're not gonna do foolish things because you've numbered the days that you have. You're not gonna waste your time doing things that have nothing to do with God's kingdom. You will number your days to be an everyday disciple, to share in your Father's joy. So this silly paper tape measure is very sobering. In fact, I have mine taped up on my computer screen, like right at the bottom of the monitor, to remind me that my days are limited because I spend too much time looking at my computer screen. So my encouragement to you is to take this tape measure and put it somewhere. And if you really want to be sobered, every birthday, you chop one of those numbers off. It's time for us to wake up, family. It's time to live into the calling that God has put on us, our purpose. Our primary purpose is to be a disciple maker. Our primary purpose is to be an everyday disciple. God has given us language, he's given us a direction, and this is where we're going, church family. So it's time for us to stand and wake up to discipleship. It's time for, maybe some of us were dry bones and we're, we, it's time for us to rattle. We're gonna sing this song here in a moment, so please stand with me. I hope that the presence of God, His Holy Spirit, His glory, would come down into this place and begin to waken you up to the reality of discipleship, that you would be an everyday disciple, that no longer that we would sit on the chairs and just be consumers, that we would go empowered, filled, led by the Holy Spirit, where we work, live, and play because God is able to use you. He's able to use your hurt. He's able to use your pain. He's able to use all of it to magnify his kingdom, amen?
My prayer is that we would all be awakened to the reality that it's not just a Sunday discipleship thing. It's an everyday discipleship thing. Prayer partners, if you want to move to the corners, please. If you need prayer, if you need to be lifted up for anything, if you've got a praise on your lips that you want to share, our, our prayer partners are here to serve you in that capacity. Everything is confidential. If you're new here to Radiant Life, so glad you guys were here. Right outside is a green pillar, Guest Central. Stop by, say hello. We got a little gift for you. And just so you know, like a month from now is Christmas, right? So I want to give you guys our Christmas time. So we're going to do Christmas at Radiant Life Saturday, December 23rd at 6 p.m. And then our Sunday services, we're going to leave them the same on Christmas Eve. We're going to do our 9 and 11 as is. So you choose out of one of those three. We'll do candlelight, everything the same. But there's your three options. Think about someone to invite. And then we're going to have fun the Sunday prior to Christmas Eve. We, as a church family, are just going to do a Christmas sweater Sunday, okay? So Sunday, December 17th, you wear either a cool Christmas sweater or an ugly Christmas sweater. It doesn't matter. Just wear it. We're going to do something fun as a church family, okay? So a couple weeks from now, it's Christmas sweater Sunday. I had someone at our previous service say, but what happens if I think it's actually pretty and other people think it's ugly? Well, that's on you. Good luck trying to figure that one out, all right? We're going to be careful how we compliment people on that Sunday, right? But there it is. And uh, our students, we are sending over 20 students, uh, high schoolers, to our follow conference in Cincinnati over Christmas break. And so thank you, church, for your support in that and helping our students go. I know this is the last day. I know there's a bunch of kids that want to show up at our Christmas market that we're having here at the church Friday and Saturday. We're hosting a Christmas market. And I know they want to sell goodies, like treats, goodies, uh, like cookies and pies that will help fundraise even more because you were able to lower their costs, but they still got to like get over there and stuff. So they're working hard and I love seeing teens work hard for things. And so I know for them, they would love if you make cookies or make pies, you want to make something that they can sell as a fundraiser, just drop it off at the church anytime this week. We'll take that. And then our teens are just going to sell and they're eager. They're hungry to go and I'm excited for them. In high school, middle school, just FYI, there's no youth tonight. So enjoy the long holiday week.